members of the floor, inviting people like Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson on TV is tremendously great because for the first time, we think we have engagement. For the first time, we can actually argue against these people because we think the alternative that opposition has to defend was the status, uh, was the was the situation before we invited them to TV, right? The alternative is that these people go back to unaccessible holes such as forums in Reddit or the dark web, for instance, or worse, what happens is they clamp down and do not use rational arguments, but instead use things such as racism or fear in order to buy conservatives to their side. And we think that's the worst world to live in. We will talk about three things, two things in today's debate maybe. Firstly, we will talk about how this is the best way to deal with conservatism in our world. But secondly then, we will talk about how the conservatives will be less extreme when they feel like they have a platform to talk on versus in their world where they do, they do not. Let's go to the first argument about how this best deals with conservatism, right? There's a few things to note, to note here. I think the first thing is that we think what happens in, in their world, that it is true that we would have wish, given that they are now on mainstream media, what happens is there's a lot more people reading into this people, uh, like, like knowing their arguments, and a lot the conservatives are more like accessible to a lot more people. And I think that's something that opening your will concede. But I think the heart of this debate lies to how do we de best deal with conservatism Conservatism, right? And I think what's most important is even if there is more accessibility in their world, what happens is at least in our world, we can at least argue and we can at least engage with them, leading to less people buying into conservatism. Right. Why? I think what happens in our world is a few things. One, I think that the alternative in their world is that they go into like forums such as Reddit, for instance, like where they like clamp down more on their ideas, right? I think there's no okay. engagement there because what happens and what is necessarily true is that when they go into those kinds of forums, when fans say there's people who are likely to buy into one side or another go into those forums because possibly their conservative friend told them that this is something they should look into. The multiculturalism what? is something that is horrible, for instance. These are the things that answers the, the kind of ailments that you have. What necessarily happens is they buy straight into that idea without any kind of engagement. It is true, in status quo, you can still have liberal forums existing and people on the mainstream, eh, sorry, we think that is in what happens in our world, you can, in, in our alternative world, where they are not mainstream, the vast majority of mainstream media is liberal and it's true those arguments exist. But what's most important is to have them on the same platform. Why is that important? Okay. It's important because having them on the same platform, we can have liberal arguments engaging with them. So in their world, where the conservative ideas are just in the forums, in, in certain forums such as Reddit, for instance, those ideas are not engaging to the liberal ideas. It, it kind of sounds like a bad debate where people don't engage, right? And I think what's most important is that people engage because that's how you break down the arguments and that's how liberals are able to get people into their side. Before I move on, sure, closing. Yeah, so just to be as clear as possible, you want there to be more exposure of these views, but you want fewer people to believe their views, right? You I think fewer people agree with them, you think they are wrong. I think there's two things that will pause it. One, fewer people believe because at least there is some engagement. But secondly, I think even in your world, where a lot of uh, less people believe, I think in your world you have to defend that people believe in it in a more extreme manner because there's no engagement coming from the other side and there's no way to kind of change and like for people on the ground to kind of weigh two different ideas, right? But secondly, we will talk about the second alternative in their world. I think a world in which these people, such as Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson, are not famous, what necessarily happens to the conservative is that their argument results back to things that are unable, that liberals are unable to engage. Things such as emotional arguments, for instance, or secondly, going back to ideas such as culture, for instance, or religion, it's really horrible for us to engage, right? Firstly, like, let's talk about emotional. Like, literally, what happens in their world is they will resort to things such as dogmas and rooted conceptions such as religion. So what happens is, if you do not have Sam Harris, for instance, trying to like use rationality to defend conservatism, you will have them all believing in like a pressure that horrible interpretations of the Bible to defend why like women should get less, for instance. I think it's much easier for liberals to engage on dogs that is rational rather than engage in dogs that are rooted in dogmas and in systems that is unaccessible towards the liberals because it's really hard for them to change interpretations at the end of the day. But the second thing we will posit is this. I think what will also happen is that you would necessarily now have scrutiny towards the conservatives' idea. Why? Because I think in a world in which these people aren't on mainstream media, what happens is progressives are internally more complicit. That is why a lot of progressives, for instance, do not conceptualize or aren't was did not believe that Donald Trump would have won the election, but they were super surprised when it happened, right? Because they're complacent. Because a world in which there's no engagement of these people on TV, they thought that mainstream media, being hugely liberal biased, 
means it represents everybody. So they thought everybody is usually liberal by this idea and everything. I think that's the worst word because they are complacent because they do not have any kinds of arguments to like uh, to, 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 to engage like new audience point conservatives that is entirely more uh, important at the end of uh, that is entirely more convincing than the conservatives of the past. Secondly, let's talk about how conservatives are less extreme in our world. I think what happens in our world is that the, it's true that when you do not invite these people on TV, what most likely happens is conservatives feel that they, their place is less heard of, right? Why is that likely? I think this. I think what happens is necessarily they become more extreme, and I don't. I like we are not positive that they'll be extreme in a way which, like you know, these people would in yeah, yeah, make terrorist groups or whatever. But what happens is when they become more extreme, these people literally place. Uh, what happens is plays out in real life by having things such as assault, for instance, or actual discrimination towards people on the ground. Why is this likely? This is likely because what happens on the ground is that one, conservatives feel that they are unheard. Secondly, their leaders are able to rile up sentiments because they will point out to the liberal media and say, ah, oh, these people are not listening to us. See, oh, the political machinery is against us. Everybody is uh, having a conspiracy against us. And that's what happens. Right? What will necessarily happen is, I think what happens is you have more assaults, for instance, against minorities. You have actual discrimination of people not taking these people that have, uh, into jobs because they feel like their position is entirely attracted because they are not having any kind of platform to be heard of. This argument is important because the way in which it's way to the debate is that in our world we are able to minimize harms towards minorities, for instance, and actual discriminations, right? And I think that it's most important because they have to answer why in their world, if these conservatives are more right up, they will be more moderate than our world. And I think that's entirely more important. But I think what's most important that opposition also has to defend is a world in which they resort to other arguments such as other than rationality and how liberals are able to win on those grounds. And I think it's really hard for opposition to defend that, but they, uh, but they do, and that's the burden upon them. Very proud of the post. <laughs> risk in the model that OG brings you today. They expect people to know when they, and there's like a wider platform for views that we otherwise considered bigoted, to go on YouTube videos, to see comments praising those videos, to see comments deleted that are against those videos, and then to watch all, like the 10 minute video by Stan Harris or Miley Gannatis, and still expect to, instead of being persuaded by one of those people, um, 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 now apparently share a bunch of videos against them. We think that's not what happens. We think the appearance of how these platforms work means that your views are far more likely to be entrenched and now you're likely to reach a wider audience. We're going to bring you two things on opening bar. Firstly, we're going to tell you that you just reach, um, you reach more people, you become more bigoted and make views mainstream in a way that makes them worse. And then secondly, we tell you that you get a lack of engagement at the point at which people only reinforce the otherwise uh, bigoted views that they've had. Um, so a lot of rebuttal is integrated, but I want to deal um, with a couple of points that OG brings you up top. So first, note that all of their stuff requires you to believe that the platforms that they're talking about on which the mainstream platforms on which people now enter are platforms that are conducive to some form of engagement. But also note that the kinds of discourse that we've heard over the last few months have proven that that's empirically untrue. The fact that you only ever encounter views that you agree with because of the way in which algorithms of Facebook and YouTube work means that all of that never actually occurs. The second thing we want to chat about is um, they, they say sort of like the alternative is you get horrible interpretation of the Bible, which are hard to which are hard to be. Look, the exact problem with people like Milo Minakalis and Sam Harris is the pseudoscience that they peddle, which makes it very likely that even like educated middle class people are far more likely to buy into it, are far more likely to think that that's mainstream, that that's something that they can actually accept. The fact that it's like curtain and like, and like sort of dressed up as science means that that's something that you that you actually need because like, let's face it, nobody actually understands science at all. The third thing is, we think that on, on this question of whether conservatives
act better because they feel victimized. Look, most conservatives do not actually access the kinds of sites that you want to talk about. We're going to get to that in a second. But the point is, most conservatives aren't on Reddit. Most conservatives aren't on the dark web. That is to say, you like increase the quantum of conservatives who now feel as if they, they, they believe things, but also note that they still feel victimized at the point in which they believe Sam Harris is correct, but then they see like, you know, Facebook like having celebrating Pride Month and they feel as if their views are still are still victimized. That still happens on your side. So let's chat about the categories, let's chat about what um, what these views look like outside of the mainstream. They're usually private, they're on Reddit, we think the audience is uh, pretty small, and we think people who access them know that they're accessing them on 4chan or Reddit or like, you know, like private sites, right? They know it's an act of secrecy, an act of rebellion. That is to say, they just an act like putting in a password to access threads, you know that you're not supposed to share those views. You know that most people do not agree with you. I think that's particularly important. Also positive that these views are usually bad. I want to stress on this. Note that these views are bad. Uh, note that like, the reason we call them politically incorrect is because they hurt people. They deny the existence of people within our democracy. They prevent the ability of people to um, to sort of have, um, to sort of engage in discourse within our democracy. So what happens when you actually bring them into the mainstream, right? So the fact that you change these audiences from sort of secretive um, to mainstream that gets you gets you three uh, uh, get, get, get you to three things in particular. So first, the, we think more extreme content just becomes a lot more acceptable, right? So we think. Um, a lot of stuff generally is not bad enough to be kicked out of YouTube and Facebook because generally like the kinds of people running these are sort of like libertarian, like Silicon Valley types or they just don't want to piss a lot of people off because they have a lot of conservatives on their platform, right? Like Lord Zuckerberg has a testimony where he had to defend kicking conservatives off. The consequence of this is that views like that are actually really, really bad, peddled by people like Sam Harris, remain on Facebook, remain on YouTube such that they can have a massive, massive audience. But I think the second thing that's particularly bad is that the kinds of algorithms run on Facebook and YouTube do a couple of things. We think the first thing they give you a chain of video links essentially, which means that once you watch a video by one of these people, you're far more likely to see the next 10 videos on your YouTube autoplay by them. That is to say, you now think that the sheer number of videos that are that is actually in support of the position that you're considering is like massive, right? And you don't actually see a ton of videos debunking those things. That is to say, if you see a video title or uh, like you know, feminist, like politically correct, someone you know, proven wrong, you're, you're like the next, you know, your entire newsfeed becomes that. That is to say, some Consciously, you tend to believe that those things are within the mainstream. But the second thing is, we think YouTube and Facebook also rely on hate positions on ads. That is to say, like right-wing conservative people tend to bump up their own positions and also tend to like specifically target ads on like people who are sort of just beginning to consider or to, um, um, sort of um, conservative positions. That is to say, once you watch like one video, you're far more likely to see other videos that are that are similar. We think the third important thing that occurs is within these videos themselves, like the kinds of comments that you see are also are also like tend to reinforce your views, right? Because the kinds of people who venture out into Miley Annapolis's comment are not generally liberal people. They're not liberal people because liberal people know that like they, they know that like a lot of what they're seeing is either BS or because it genuinely hurts people to want to watch videos okay. that are uh, that are very, very offensive and that uh, bring you no no benefit. Yeah. They've been on YouTube for a very long time. This debate is about whether or not they should be put onto more mainstream media, which we would say is probably something along the lines of like news or TV, right? The info side literally says they've already been on YouTube for so long, and that's a platform that you're probably necessarily needing to defend. So we're happy to defend that other people who are still on Reddit, who are sort of still in the shadows, should not come onto YouTube. But we're also happy to defend the second phase of that, right? That is, they should not go into more into like more mainstream channels for all the reasons that we're giving, right? We think the reasons about acceptability of what views are are much worse. So. For instance, if you think a YouTube view is more acceptable than a Reddit view, like you seeing something on Fox News is much worse than you seeing them on YouTube, right? And for those, um, and, and so I think all of that applies to the kinds of things that you want to do. This. But also note the consequence of what this actually makes you think you're attaining that. You think firstly it just solidifies your views, right? You think you're fool, we think people are fooled into thinking that something is a consensus and something is in the mainstream and it's genuinely not. So people, like a lot of conservatives, genuinely actually think that like so-called politically correct liberals are a minority, but they like actually own the state and they. Able to sort of control what actually happens. Like they genuinely, genuinely think that like pro-liberal, like socially liberal policies are like the job sorrows, like controversy, and everyone else, like the you know, so-called silent majority, agrees with them. We think that's a massive, massive problem. Contrast that to people not being on the mainstream, right? When you access things offline, when you know that the very act of you accessing things, or even if you like access them on YouTube versus the comparative of on Fox News, right? Just like inherently means that you're far less likely to think that other people agree with you. But the second thing is you treat people worse, right? When you be, when you bind to the acceptability of opinions, you're far more likely to think like following my or like John Peterson. For instance, that homosexuality is like biologically impossible. You're far more likely to be like homophobic. You're far more likely to use slurs. You're far less likely to hire gay people or to be friends with gay people. We think 
to multiply that with the number of people who are now exposed to news, right? So even if you want to like talk about Fox News where 40 million people tune in every day versus 4 million people on a Jordan Peterson video, that's 36 million new people who are being actively worse because they think that there are acceptable opinions that are being peddled, acceptable opinions that can justify their own hatred in their daily lives. That's not something that Tex and I are willing to defend, so happy to be on our part. Okay. Because these are not necessarily people who tune 
listening to your Reddit and whatnot. This is why it's important that we put that in the mainstream media. But even if, right, the better part of it is that you also push the middle fans to also act on this because the people who are for long that ease their own guilt by saying there's no problem happening, these people will have a constant reminder that there is a problem happening. Because wherever they turn their mainstream media, they realize that there is a problem and they're guilty for not dealing with this particular problem. And I think that's how you get the most amount of engagement and that will translate into better protection uh -huh. in our world. Yes. Okay, but you're not envisioning right how this actually plays out, right? When George Peterson goes on the TV, he doesn't say, oh great, my views are getting represented. He says, my views have been shut out by the University of Toronto trying to oppress me. So the cognitive of dissonance you're talking about just gets amplified and exposed to more people. That's, that goes back to the first premise that I talked about. Viewing doesn't necessarily need to be made. In both worlds, your Jordan Peterson will exist, some people will believe it. But what's important is you have another group that provides a counter narrative to the arguments that he brings. But the second level to this argument, you also create more conversation from the groups that are directly attacked. How does this happen? We need kind of validation that we're able to create now in the world means you're able to give the courage to the minority to actually come up and speak about this case. For example, when you already attacked some sexual progressives, you have other groups of women coming up also telling their part of the stories. You know, they finally feel like, oh, it's okay for me to talk about sexual harassment. It's not just a small thing that I should show. It's not just my problem, it's everyone's problem. We think these are also more likely to happen when you put these groups in a more defensive position. That means the, the extra benefit that we get on our side is that you get more stories from the people who are actually affected rather than just waiting for someone who are progressive that comes from a privileged background to talk about these things in a way that perhaps other people couldn't empathize with. And also through these stories, you get more nuanced narrative to properly <coughs> understand as to why they are being oppressed and what form does this oppression take into. And I think that's where you're just able to come up with a proper solution when you realize what comes from. This argument has to be weighed against the alternative that would happen there. I don't think that the alternative is they would just be okay with existing on YouTube. I think given when conservatism can no longer see themselves as being able to push this sort of type of argument, they are more likely going to fall back on using religious sentiments to convert people to their kind of ideology. This is harder for us to break because it's very difficult for you to question your imams or question your priests. In certain religion, it's a sin to question the kind of ideologies that they already have. They're going to use the guilt of religion which makes it more difficult to have counter narrative to this. Compare this to having pseudoscience, at least logic can be debunked. You can always have a counter research to show them as to why those logic don't work and that's more likely going to be believed by people. But the other thing that I want to talk about is the whole idea of discourse and conversation. We need a good conversation. It's not just a conversation that provides information, but rather provides engagement so people are able to digest that particular information and see what argument is correct and which one works. None of this can happen in the opposition's world where it's just one-sided. Oh, yes, 
like, uh, you know, they, I've been sexually assaulted. That, that, that problem was happening well before Trump did that. What instead happened is a large number of people trying to imitate that or thinking it was probably acceptable to treat women in the same way, because if a presidential candidate is doing that, it probably must be acceptable as well to do these things under the trappings of a, an enlightened form of gender equality. So I'm just not sure those benefits do exist. If anything, it empowers more people to act in similar ways, even if it isn't to the same important extent, because I think a toned down version of that is not acceptable in the new overturn window. On the specific argument about complacency as opposed to having a reminder, I actually want to ask this question, right? Why is this argument important? Why is it important that we are no longer complacent about the existence of racism or hate in our society? I think the answer should not be to change everyone's minds and to extinguish it entirely. Not just because it's practically impossible, but actually just, you know, like a freedom of thought is something that should exist. I think the goal we should strive for is a society that is full of, I and mean, I literally can mean this in the sense, no, 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 no like joke, of safe spaces where people can actually you know, live a life in society that, that isn't uh, that doesn't feel as though they're being threatened by these views when they are held by individuals. That is to say, we should care more about the actions that people undertake. And if it is indeed true that people's actions do end up manifesting way more when we, when we shift this into the mainstream, that is a bad thing. So the complacency here is, is not a sort of end in itself, it's, it's a means to a specific end of the type of the society we want to live in, and we build that society significantly better. It also deals with the argument for religious doctrines, by the way, because again, like just don't see the impact of shifting the type of justification they use unless it is that the justification becomes more or less impactful on people. Last of all, on the courage to speak up. I've already suggested that this actually diminishes when you know that when you speak up, you will likely be attacked by someone in a, in a position of some influence on a public platform as opposed to having this attack heard by a small group on Reddit. But second of all, I'm just not sure why one place an additional burden on the victims of hate crimes or of suffering to do this thing even more when it's unclear what the long run benefit is, given that in the counterfactual, the society they were living in was broadly safe for them to exist in. So, uh, it's better in the shadows. Second of all, is engagement there to break down ideas? Now, opening up the right to say that listening to a view doesn't mean you believe it. But more importantly, I just dispute the fact that a rational view is less persuasive because it can be engaged with. I think a rational view is often harder to engage with and harder to refute because it's internally consistent. And that's the problem with people like Jordan Peterson. The way they run these arguments, I think, incredibly tantalizing in the way you think about this. For example, they point out things like, statistically, it is true that white police officers are more likely to be shot in certain neighborhoods than the average black person. That's a function of their job, but as a statistic, it is true and hard to refute because it's empirically based in some sort of data study. Or alternatively, if you want to defend the fact that colonialization was good, lots of people point to my country in Singapore, where in local history, a lot of the local history textbooks talk about the, the contributions of the British, and it's easy to point to a country like that and say, even they acknowledge that, that colonialization was good for them. So these sorts of rational arguments are rational. That doesn't mean they're easy to break down. If anything, on a public platform, they become quite hard to deal with when they present the quite persuasively. But here are a few more structural reasons for that. The broad overarching structural reason is that these platforms are not hostile to these views. Three reasons for that. Number one, because the audience when it comes to news consumption is already ideological. They do not pick the most centrist outlet and go, ah, I love the font type of the New York Times, let's go with that. No, they pick outlets based on what they broadly or be aligned and see themselves aligning with. As a result, it is unlikely that the outlet as a whole is an incentive to try and attack these views to a large extent. If anything, they ask leading questions to prompt them to explain these views in ways that can be accessible to the public. Second of all, because TV networks themselves don't tend to be the liberal ones inviting Jordan Peterson and Cole on. Uh, and Really, it just seems true that the mainstream media right now chooses to no platform these individuals as opposed to actually engaging with them. So the, the thing we are regretting or supporting isn't actually the New York Times or liberal branches of the media inviting these individuals out, it's the Fox News of the world. But last of all, in many cases, they get an advanced copy of the questions or get to control what those questions are. In the same way that on YouTube, they get advanced, they get to control what types of comments exist on that space. So, like, for example, when these people were invited to the Oxford Union, I mean, we didn't have an incentive to piss them off because we wanted to invite future guests there. It's embarrassing to acknowledge. But the point is, net net, these platforms are not going to be hostile to their ideas, and as a result, will not lead to significant engagement. What it will lead to is a larger audience thinking as though these ideas have been questioned, and as a result, thinking it is now valid to believe them or hold them because there is a degree of scrutiny that is there. Lots of people in America believe news outlets, I'm thinking in just a second, as an authoritative source of information and news. That's what's unique about news outlets. If you do think this space about news outlets, we also thought mainstream media was about YouTube, so that the first part of the case was about. But either way, the point is there is an added stamp of authority each way when you move from Reddit to YouTube and on YouTube to Fox News. So that's a terrible thing uh, for these. Yeah. So engagement doesn't just happen on TV or during that particular time. I think engagement can also happen when your viewers that viewed it to you, which you see a lot of people, also talk about these things and say whether they agree or disagree with the kind of things that they see on that TV. Cool. 
and, 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 and we, just, we just don't want more people to say they agree because the, the harm of more people saying they agree are the size of microaggressions or types of voting blocks that you care about. So sure, more people will now say they disagree. I'm not sure what the net impact of that is, but we can be certain that the people who now say they agree will do bad things to back up those beliefs. Last of all, uh, do these views become more moderate? I'm just not sure what the reason was here, beyond the fact that they'll have to take a different tack, which I suggest that is more persuasive. In fact, if anything, uh, on some sort of a large media platform, in order to differentiate yourself from many other conservatives on the plethora of people you have from Fox News, your incentives to be even more extreme or to be distinctive in the position you're holding. That is, you will now stress not the broad bits of things that unite all conservatives, you will try and stress the things like the racism, the things like the colonization, the things like the sexism, because those are the things that get you invited back on, and those are the things that your supporters can latch onto, and retweet, and, and share, and so on and so forth. Now, which means that, that the way you present those views, even if they could have been a, could have been a broad base of conservative ideas, ends up being the bits that, you know, for all those purposes, we need to set like For all of these reasons, all of the impacts that opening government care about are flipped. There is more exposure of a dangerous sort on their side of the house for all these reasons. for O to say that they wanted these views in the shadow. We agree to some extent that these views are unpalatable and that they might offend some people. But there is some intrinsic reason as to why these people have these views. These views should be heard and they should be moderate. So I'm going to do two things in this speech. First of all, I'm going to provide a better characterization of the issues with the conservative movement as to why they don't get means of expression on their side of the house. And secondly, I want to talk, I want to talk about why you shift towards a more rationalist version of politics which will be better and facilitate moderation. Before that, three points of rebuttal to what we heard from OO. The first thing I just want to note is just kind of like the strategic tension in what they were talking about, because they kind of missed the comparative. What we heard from LO was a critique of YouTube and Facebook, i.e. how the algorithms of those two social media platforms inherently prioritize biases you already have. We agree to that, and we're going to flip their argument to say that that's an argument for our side of the house, that you're not able to have acceptance of liberals, that you're not able to see the other side of the fence because you only see views that are continued, that are, that are the same as yours. What happens then is that people are more likely to resort to violence, and that's what you get on their side of the house. The second thing we heard from DLO was that they get more safe spaces, and they would prefer that. We would prefer safe spaces as well. But here's the thing. Safe spaces don't exist on their side of the house because you don't have exposure to these views in the first place. Safe spaces are contingent on you being willing to accept the rationalist view of the, the other arguments and to accept those views as legitimate. So if you have safe spaces on your side of the house, what you have to support is violence like at places like UC Berkeley because you weren't able to accept conservative yeah. viewpoints. We think that's incredibly bad. The final thing that we heard was that we, this is some views might be incredibly persuasive because you base that off of rationalism, but I don't know why that's bad. If a statistic is incredibly persuasive and it brings light to an issue, you should be able to integrate that into your own platform. And that's where you get moderation. So if you want to bring up a statistic about the oppression of African Americans through police officers, you, liberals can choose to accept that, fac that facet of conservatism and implement that into their platform. But no, People who look at platforms as some holistic idea, where if you support one thing, you have to buy into you know, the entire platform. Instead, you can take certain sub certain segments of those views and implement that into the liberal platform. We think that's where you lead to moderation, and that's where we're different from OG. So, now, I'll, I'll, the rest of my rebuttal will be innovative. So, I'm going to go into my first extension onto the issues of the conservative movement. So, note that OG largely talked about why there's a lack of expression, and they merely asserted that without necessarily explaining why. What I'm going to bring you is to explain these structural issues as to how they cannot Get, get expression, why you demean stereotypes on our side, and I'm going to explain to you why expression through intellectual discourse is uh, preferable. There are two issues with expression in the status quo. 
The first is that these people often cannot express themselves, not because they are incapable of having these viewpoints, but often because of the systemic issues that happen in these communities. When we look at conservatism in the United States, the main voter base of Trump happens to be white, the white working class in the Rust Belt, who happen not to have education because of the systemic issues of the government. So they might have their own views on, like gender, on gender and on homosexuality, but they use slurs and unpalatable language. We might not have that because we have debate coaches and equity officers that tell us to avoid from those types of language, but they don't. And what happens then is the stereotype that these are bad views, you should not accept them, and you're able to use language to demean them. Compare that to Peterson, who is an intellectual, who devote themselves to studying this as more education we think it's better on, this, uh, on our side of the house. But secondly, the greatest problem with the conservative movement is that these issues of language and lack of education means that they're demeaned and that there's an illegitimate movement. And what happens is that the liberals think that the main ra they're the rationalist actor in politics. They think that the movement of science and how they you know, support things like climate change and demean them. And they think they're amalgamating the amalgamation of educated intellectuals. The problem is there are conservative intellectuals, but on their side, they're relegated towards these shadows of echo chambers and never brought to light. OG talked about why you improve conservatism. I'm going to extend on that and talk about why, even if you uh, improve conservatism, why the most important thing in this debate is to shape, shape the, uh, change the perception of conservatism as a legitimate movement, regardless of whether these are moderate or not. Why do we get that? A couple of reasons. The first reason is that we get visibility in the dominance of, intellect, the dominance of conservative intellectuals. Because now, these people become the representatives of the movements. Not the people you see on the, you know, like CNN, where they interview people supporting Trump, and they portray them as really stupid, illegitimate political views, but instead you have people like Peterson, who do have intellectual arguments, who do turn to things like statistics. We think that's comparatively better. But secondly, note that you get moderation. They talked about why you all don't go to centrist, uh, you don't go to like centrist views, but instead you choose news sources that are not distant to your own. But the difference is, when you're able to have visibility, like inviting Peterson onto a television interview, what happens is you get greater visibility of these, greater visibility of rationalist arguments. So when you turn to things like statistics, like reason, these are incredibly persuasive arguments, and liberals can buy into that. They can recognize the problems that African Americans face, that the working class face, and they're more likely to cater towards that. On their side, these minorities are forever in this state, forever ignored by politics because people do not want to engage with them because they think that these people are unintellectual, they don't want to engage with them. The comparative is echo chambers where you do not hear where you do not where you do not hear any sort of conservative views, where liberals continue to go on Facebook and social media in terms of the dominance of news media, where as we can see, they go turn to things that are uh, coincide with their viewpoints, we think that's comparatively better. So here, the issues of the conservative movement are that you're not able to engage uh, a whole lot of minute, uh, you're not able to engage with other viewpoints, and you change that because you give these people a means of intellectual expression. Yeah. You argue it's good if intellectuals are face the conservative movement. Can you give us a structural reason why the conservative movement has up till now disavowed intellectuals? Except since Jordan Peterson is right. It, it's not that they disavow intellectuals, it's that intellectuals can't be the voice of these people. The liberal media and mainstream media reaches a wide audience. Like CNN reaches the entire audience of the US, BBC reaches the entire audience of Britain. So these people do exist, but they aren't seen as legitimate because they don't have any visibility in the first place. We support more visibility for them through the means of media. Next, I'm going to talk about you shift towards a new version of politics that's more centered on reasonable discourse. They said you just want engagement. I'm going to extend on that and talk about why this engagement is better. What are the characterizations of intellectuals? I'm going to emphasize on the intellectual dark web rather than the dark web that they talk about. The characterization of intellectuals is that they appeal to reason, they use rational arguments, they publish academic papers like Peterson does. On their side, violence results, because when you don't have arguments that are based on emotion, what happens is you turn to violence. We change this for two reasons. First of all, you push liberals to also justify their views as well. So when you hear an incredibly persuasive conservative argument that might be distant to your own, you can't just take it down by appealing to emotion and attacking the other person, but instead to justify your own views, to show some sort of intellectual superiority, to become the persuasive viewpoints of those these people's interests. But secondly, you push for more academic discourse. You have the acceptance of others. Intellectuals, and even us in like IB and AP curriculums, are now taught to consider multiple different perspectives when we write essays, or we write other, or, or, or write essays or do presentations. That's comparatively better, because intellectuals are able to accept other views. We think it's good to have unpalatable views, because that leads to moderation of conservative movements, but more importantly, shapes perception as an intellectual movement that can be accepted. Proud to propose. Thank you.
really two things in extending this. Uh, the first is to say that the intellectual dark web offers a misdiagnosis of political problems, and we think the consequences of that misdiagnosis are uh, highly problematic. And second, why we think the traditional media amplifies these, uh, this misdiagnosis and therefore harms of it. And the third one will just be impacting those. I think the issue with this debate thus far is the proposition of both unwilling to say that these views are necessarily either correct in and of themselves, or even until closing government, even instrumentally good. And second, like failure to notice these aren't actually just isolated views in and of themselves, right? These, oper these operate as a comprehensive worldview that says, look, it's not just that these are problems in your society, it's these problems have these causes. The ultimate cause of most of your problems is political correctness. It's a political capture of the systems of government, of the systems of control within society, of the intellectual left. That if you listen to Jordan Peterson, he says that the big problem that you're facing in society is that Google has become political correct, it influences politicians, the politicians then impose their liberal views on others, and you get problems. This is a comprehensive worldview. It's also a comprehensive worldview that is incorrect, and we think the problems flow from that. Um, I'll be responding to the proposition case throughout, but just like a response to closing government to start off with as a way of framing some of those ideas. First, like this big idea of there being a lack of representation of contemporaries. We heard from both opposition teams. So opening government said, there's lack of representation in the media, and this means that people turn to extremism. Closing government continued this, and closing government also added there's lack of representation in academia. It's just not clearly true that the first is the case. I don't really have much in terms of responding to it, other than incoherent sputtering of saying Fox News exists. The BBC is, if anything, pro-establishment, and anyone that lived through the Iraq wars, read any Noam Chomsky, is fairly aware that the economic structures underlying the media push people towards conservatism, push people towards support for you know, the corporatist superstructure, push people towards, say, a pro-establishment line on a wide variety of issues. So it simply isn't clear that there is a lack of representation of conservatism, so much as there is a case that we made for saying there is a liberal bias in the media. That case is false and is amplified by the intellectual dark web, but that doesn't mean that they're correct, right? Second, within academia, okay, I mean, let's say that's kind of true to an extent that Jordan B. Peterson's views are underrepresented in academia, but that's not because he has to have the option, right? So he published Maps of Meaning and no one read it because it's not a very good book, right? It goes back to Jung, and most people don't want to go back to Jung because Jung has been fairly thoroughly discredited. Now, that might change, that might not change, but in the meantime, the reason there's a lack of players used within academia is because academia doesn't accept them because the kind of rationality that they, they give lip service to following the intellectual talk about imposing government is not necessarily pure reason, right? Rather, what you have is, as Sun Wang described it, a stupid person's idea of what an intellectual looks like. You don't really have proper rational discourse. Instead, you have people giving a representation or an appearance of rational discourse. Two possible impacts they try to point to. One is increased visibility, but it supposes that visibility is actually good and those views are good, which obviously is what we're going to be contesting. And second, more respect for intellectuals. Look, reference my POI against open government, right? The point is they're not listening to the context in which this actually happens. When you put Jordan B. Peterson on TV, people don't go, ah, maybe I can trust intellectuals, maybe I can engage in rational discourse. Instead, he says, look, I have been oppressed by the University of Toronto. You can't trust intellectuals. They're all part of some, you know, Political correct conspiracy, universities are a brainwashing cult, show on my YouTube channel, I'll tell you more. That's important for understanding this debate, and much of what flows in our case flows from that. First, intellectual dark web, obviously okay. misdiagnosis. So they point to problems in society. They point to problems that we're going to say are largely symptomatic of things like inequality, of things like the lack of provision for minorities, if we're thinking about like problems that can be pointed to with regards to multiculturalism, or things to do with you know representation of gender uh, within society. And they say, well, the big problem with this is political capture by the left, right? The left has captured the universities, and by capturing the universities, it captures societies. We don't think this is actually true. We think there's been capture of anything by the right. We think the establishment is the establishment. And we think that if anything, corporations, especially in America, which is where most of the intellectual dark web people come from, or at least set their discourse, is massively problematic. That corporations have effectively taken over the country. Why is that very problematic? Well, if we think about their claim that you need to engage more with these ideas, we don't think that you needed the intellectual dark web to tell you there are people with right wing views in America. We do think that ideally Democrats would go to red states and do you know, more polling or more you know, exposure to those views, but we don't think you need Jordan B. Peterson to tell you they're there. Similarly, following like, the, the Charlottesville uh, massacre, you don't need 
to be told there's certain extremists. They said, well, this is great because there's viscerality. Like, Jordan B. Newsom is not a visceral representation of the right wing. He's a very tweaky representation of the right wing. He makes the right wing seem as if they are more respectable than they are, and the respectability comes with a price. The price is those views come to seem to be more reasonable and more attractive because of the way that they end up being represented within the structure of the media. They said the problem is you can't necessarily check back against people using biblical language. Like, have you watched any Jordan B. Peter's videos? Like, his critique of Frozen is couched in, you know, biblical tropes and biblical language. The trouble with these intellectuals, or pseudo-intellectual representations of the right wing, is they are very hard to challenge, right? They are very hard to challenge, particularly within the concision of uh, this kind of media. And we think that's particularly problematic because the critique they offer within society has consequences to it. The more people that believe it, and they can see that there's going to be more people exposed to these views, means that you have to push back against that more. Oh. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so, would the conservative leaders be able to have more legitimacy for their oppression argument when you actually don't invite them to mainstream media? I think it's a comparative thing. So, again, you still haven't responded to my POI. I will reiterate it. When they go on mainstream media, they say, I am being oppressed. I am being oppressed by the University of Toronto. We think that that means that you don't get your benefit of saying, aha, now my views seem to be represented because what happens is people spread that message of oppression when they're represented on these platforms and more people believe that the right wing is being oppressed. So I guess the consequence is even more alt-righters appearing on the media. That is fact. Why is this particular problem? We think if you look at the way that the, the, the traditional media actually represent views, we think there's a lack of concision uh, in terms of the capacity to be able to engage in long-term discussions. We think that often the people that are actually on these shows aren't necessarily able to engage with these views in any high level of criticality. And we think there's a tendency towards sensationalism. The consequence of this is you don't really get a critical engagement on these platforms so much as people who already are disposed to believe what these platforms show them, believe in what they're told, and more likely to follow through onto things like Jordan B. Peterson Twitter page, right? That's why the engagement that they offered of saying we think social media is bad and all the harms they offered of social media about it is actually relevant to the debate because people then just go from the traditional media onto the social media and are exposed to all those harms. That is a impact of this consequence, that all their harms become multiplied because more people are exposed to them because that's the natural response to this. But second, it means that the left has to fight all these fires that have been set up. They need to try and re-educate people and make people correctly diagnose the problem as opposed to be subject to this misdiagnosis, that the left ends up losing support as a result of this and people can't fight the actual problems within society that the alt-right misdiagnosis for a very practical Secondly, discourse. Firstly, then, on conservatism. Right? The opening house debate upon this was more about ODG telling us how these people will be less rational because they'll listen to religion and emotion rather than intellectualism. We agree here. Opening opposition's critique of this is when you put it on a more widespread platform, more people are likely going to accept more extreme views. That was a problematic claim coming from opening opposition. Why is that so? As Lyndon pointed out to you, extreme views tended to be around before the intellectual dark web was. Problematically, there were racist people out there, there were people who believed that immigrants are harmful. What then was the change, right? Because that was something that I think most of opposition bench didn't really deal with in today's debate. Lyndon points out to you that the change in today's debate is that there is more use of things like statistics or intellectualism when it comes to talking about these same problems. Problems that have largely existed for a very long time, right? Unless, like, Op Whip is going to come up and tell us that racism appeared after Jordan Peterson, which we don't think is necessarily true, we think largely they needed to really engage on what the difference was in today's debate. And importantly, that difference was the use of intellectualism, right? Lenin points out to you why this means that, firstly, it's oftentimes going to be much less visceral. That is to say, they're much more likely going to engage in other people because their belief is not something that is fueled by the things that they just inherently believe in. It's largely fueled by things that are statistically and probably sometimes factually true. But the second thing is that when intellectual debates are the ones that occur, they're much more likely to engage with one another simply because of the way that inter intellectualism in academia tends to work when in comparison to just people resulting onto like assertions and the inherent problems that they believe to be true. 
Second thing then is that closing opposition then comes up and tells us about like a critique of Jordan Peterson. Basically, that was their only critique uh, of the intellectual dark web. And they basically just tell us, you know, like Jordan Peterson is really salty, so he talks about why academia punishes him for being conservative. There's two problems then that comes out of closing opposition's new statement, right? The first one was like, oftentimes this is actually true. Academia is pretty darn liberal, right? Like almost everything in academia tends to be quite Western centric and it tends to be quite liberal. So oftentimes conservative views are actually discriminated against. So we think the characterization is probably just a, another liberal mischaracterization of what then is actually happening. But secondly, you do have to note of like where these movements tend to be trending and what the comparative tends to be, right? A movement towards intellectualism is much more likely going to start to reject the salty figures that are at the top right now, like Jordan Peterson, and are much more likely going to push things like conservative values that are actually factually represented by people who don't just rant and mischaracterize what the conservative movement is trying to stand for, right? So when it comes down to a comparative, we think it's much more likely that you continue to have non-intellectuals like Donald Trump ranting on your side, whereas on our side, individuals like Jordan Peterson may yes be able to rant now, but are much less likely going to be able to rant in the future, especially when the conservative movement starts to value things like academia and intellectualism in the future. Note the fact that there is an incentive change that might happen when there is an increased prevalence in the intellectual dark web movement on our side, right? The second thing that then comes out of CO is like, you know, people already know Fox News, so there's no real reason why they, they, they already have some sort of channel by which they're able to access their conservatism. And right, we agree that is true. The point that Lineage was trying to tell you is that when you change the way that they actually engage with conservatism, right? When you change the way to push it towards a more intellectual sphere, you're much less likely then going to be upon the light upon the things that opening government tries to talk to us about, right? Secondly, then, onto discourse. There are two things here. The first one was the mechanism debate about like sold uh, about like mainstream media from opening house. OG tells us that you get more views and there's more discourse because there are more views, and we think that is to some extent true. Opening opposition then responds by firstly critiquing YouTube's echo chambers. But I think Vivian rightly points out that four uh, minutes of LO speech is probably irrelevant in that your side probably needs to demand YouTube because that is the platform that they were using before they accessed mainstream media. But Tech tries to save this, right? He comes up and says news is also also self-selecting, and it also has things like leading questions. So Fox News is only going to re reimburse; uh, they're only going to reinforce the values of conservatives, right? But that wasn't the proper comparative, right? Because the comparative that we wanted to point out was the fact that liberals would also be engaging with individuals like Jordan Peterson. So yes, sure, on our side, conservatives still are still going to be conservative. But the difference is on our side that liberals now necessarily have to engage with speakers from the conservative side that are not just ranting and telling you about why religion proves their points. You have to engage with speakers that are now going to tell you why well, statistically it is true that in some neighborhoods maybe it is true that white cops get shot more so maybe there should be some sort of change along the lines of maybe having ethnically homogenous police officers which are maybe probably going to result in less casualties right then there was a quite awkward part of his speech where he starts talking about why safe spaces are good. But the problem with that argument was like, he did impact a little bit of why safe spaces are beneficial, but he had nowhere to like compare this to opening government, which we think are very valid impacts as to why safe spaces are oftentimes bad and they lead to more extremism. So on that point, it's probably still lush, even though they try to avoid the discourse debate as a whole. So before I point out why uh, women's exclusive extension is quite important when it comes to discourse, I'll take a point from over. Your case is that there's intellectualism, which comes with the bad evil bits, but in the long run, we'll drop the evil bits and just keep the intellectualism. Can you give us a reason why, given that we've told you that intellectualism makes the evil bit more popular in the long run? Right, but what we're talking about is like what you say is evil might sometimes be a legitimate conservative value. And the point at which conservatives start realizing that there are factual ways to back their truth rather than there's emotional and religious ways, they're probably more likely than then having preference for these ways of justifying the views. And when that is true, they're probably more so going to be tending towards intellectuals who are actually representative rather than intellectuals who are just salty towards academia like Jordan Peterson. So we think on a balance of trends, it's probably more likely to happen on our side. But unfortunately, Linden explains to you another real reason why discourse doesn't happen properly in the status quo. That is to say, conservatives oftentimes need to break through the stereotype that they're not just racists and bigots that depend entirely on emotion. And this is different from OO because OO tells you why conservatism improves. We're telling you why the perception of conservatism is oftentimes the reason why discourse can't happen. And because of that problem, we say the change is that you can have actual scientific backing, which allows you to break down like the monopoly that liberals have had on claiming that they're the intellectuals and they're the ones 
ones that are factually correct. And this changes a lot of things, right? The first thing that this changes is liberals oftentimes do need to engage you, right? Because they want to defend the side that they are actually intellectual. And oftentimes this means that they also need to resist you and try to prove you, counter prove you with their own statistics or analysis. And we think this is generally just plausible, right? But the second and important thing is you get more and better types of engagement, right? Intellectual engagement means that you can oftentimes have more pragmatic politics. Things like actually realizing maybe it is true that white cops shouldn't be in black communities where there are strong racial tensions. Things in instances where there are actual statistics that can be co-opted by either conservative or liberal sides means that you generally just get better politics in general. We think we improve discourse by allowing for actual intellectual stimulation when the comparative on their side is probably something that is much less. Very proud to folks. I think it's very interesting that the entire government branch thinks what's happening within those blocks are independent from what's happening outside the so-called echo chamber. Actually, these things are two different things. I don't think that it's very likely for these people to close or turn off each other blocks or a YouTube channel as soon as he got invited to a TV program. That is precisely saying that whatever leadership base, that is precisely saying whatever happened originally within this blocks and within your YouTube channels would not be create any difference at all. The readership these so-called evil or, or dark intellectuals based on readership are originally are on right-wing ideologies. These part got unchanged because our original fans the, the uh, uh, original basements of the star intellectuals they appeal to are still going to be easier. The only difference can be proposed from their side is that the subtle justification of their opinions because it makes themselves to think to be more stubborn as, as long as they think they are right. For, like the so-called engagement or discussion with liberal forces their side to propose would not happen because these original fan base fans that they want to appeal to are not listening and don't care about your engagement at all. For the way we go to this box and if you only if, even if you got invited to Fox News to so thank you, they selectively report exposed these enclosures only taking the video clips that favoring their own opinion, put it on your blogs and your YouTube channels that only backfires the social change you want to uh, you want to propose for. This, let's be very clear in here. The so-called isolation of these groups of ultra-conservatives is not caused by you. It's caused by them. That they choose to isolate by themselves and refuse to listen to you. That's precisely why simply by getting them out here and talking to them doesn't work at all. The, the, what's the difference we propose on site closing audition? No, thank you. We told you that the difference is on the audiences. The audiences of the of the CNN news or the Fox News are generally less critical audiences sitting in front of the TV trying to kill their time. What's the difference in here? That to say, the very fundamental change is that you direct the views and these clicks to their Facebook page, to their YouTube, and let them to say, buy my next book on the TV program. This directly adds up to the so-called, like the under the desk, the, sorry, this directly, this is precisely the next place these people want to go. That is to say, when you just let's just put away whether or not building is the equivalent of believing for a while, at least this open public exposure does add up to the underground web you want them to lose support of at the very first place. That is to say, regardless of the consequence of this TV program, at least that right. YouTube channel, no thank you, or the YouTube channel or the blogs get more subscri subscription in the short term for sure. That is why when Duncan said, uh, when Duncan said, these into dark intellectual opinions are not only hard to refute on television, but are also actually very attractive by themselves. That's why it's particularly dangerous, and we don't want this incriminating leadership to happen at the very first place. What's the second thing that we want to talk about? No, thank you. I want to talk about what happens to minorities as a first clash and as another clash in this debate. So basically, we have the opening government along with the closing government. They say they will have strong support structure for harm uh, for harm minority groups because it signals the state is caring. It pushes the Negro people to out out of complicity. There are four issues with this argument. The first thing is that I'm unclear what the support structures look like. I'm unclear whether or not there's more sympathy or there are more people donate to these act, social activities or whatever stuff. I think certainly what they're talking about is that they've got more stories 
from the victims have similar experiences, and therefore you can have a collective power to unify people to fight together. Temporary told you that more people would act in a similar, similar way against victims symmetrically. But I think a more certain reason is that this kind of collective power to fight together is not necessarily correlated with mainstream media in a very false place. No, thank you. That is why this argument is relevant to the motion, because the so-called, let's say, Me Too movement is based on Twitter, not based on BBC or Fox News. I don't think the benefit can be claimed exclusively by mainstream media in the first place. But secondly, why oftentimes this only happens on social media discussion? Because victims are oftentimes less willing to share about their victim good experiences on public media. They regard private social media content as a safe place, the impact of which is, con uh, is controllable, the audiences of their victim stories are their friends, are their relatives, that is why they're more willing to share on social media like Twitter, uh, Me Too stories, rather than on Fox News, because people don't want to be the headline of the tomorrow's newspapers at the very first place. The third thing which is uh, issue with this argument is that the entire case of the side is contingent on the fact that liberal or so-called socially progressive arguments can outwin the conservatism in the TV program and persuade more people. Temporary says that it's very hard to do so when you have empirical evidence to thank you, like statistics that are harder to refute. The serious response to this is like, well, statistics are valid evidence as well. I think the issue is more about the well use or the views of statistics about whether or not you claim correlation necessarily as a causation. That distinction might be made by another 15-page academic journal, but not by a 15-minute interview right. on the television. So thank you. Another structural reason we brought to imposing opposition is why these people are, are not likely to win over conservatism is because of those conservatives being more expressive, being misbehaving, being sensational, is precisely their style. And it's very hard to counter against this narrative on the TV show because they appeal to the more to the, to the, to the, to the more people in a more emotional way. That is why their side of the house cannot simply right. say rationality can takes a place in a TV show as well. Before we move on, opening. People will still go to YouTube and Reddit and get their bias or ideas validated there. If you don't want to debunk this on mainstream media or spark delegitimizing on social media through mainstream media, how do you plan to solve this in your world? Look, we think that YouTube channel is also regrettable morally. You think that it's okay, but in either way, that Getting it into the TV program doesn't debunk anything at all. That's a change we oppose. That's a thing we oppose in this debate. But fourthly, clearly, Point. the their side of the Facebook thank you assumes that when people go to YouTube channel or watch a talk show on Fox News, they are prepared to seek for evidence to support minority groups. I think that's just ridiculous. Given the CEO further characterize you that the liberal media and the liberal narratives dominate the current media, I don't think people will be further attracted by like liberal opinion in another TV show as well. I think when people see these programs, they are more likely to seek for unpopular opinions about conservatism. That's why the material of their opinions, the, of this conservative opinions being more attractive, for them to play with a big news is more persuasive. So fundamentally, the last thing in this debate is that their side, especially CEO claims, that the issue is lack of engagement. We brought to you the unity from CEO that the misdiagnosis of all the social problems attributing to pop up left to left wing uh, left wing or centrist politics is not only factory run, but also shuts off the engagement in the first place. We you have to say unemployment is due to <coughs> taking more refugees rather than generating the declining economy, we will say all the minority issues and redundancy of societies is unable to be engaged. That is why the our extension talks about wasting your time engaging with your issues, making you lose your support with your last emotional ability is factually relevant. I don't think that we uh, brought enough responses to that. I also think this goes beyond the simple impact of like uh, those YouTube channels are the by themselves, regardless from opening opposition. That's why we're very happy to take this event. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, if you wouldn't mind shaking hands. Oh, sorry, would you mind just closing out and it's just a bit loud? Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you guys for a really enjoyable round. Um, I will give you the call and then I'll walk through chronologically um, how we felt that the debate shook out. Um, obviously, I invite you to chat with Josh as well. Um, I thought he was going to just with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. So we ended up giving the one to opening opposition, the two to closing opposition, the three to opening government, and unfortunately, the four to closing government. So from opening government, um, yes, yeah, so we feel as though we got, to begin with, from Prime Minister, uh, you know, a case that clearly lays out the way that this makes it more likely that these figures will get engaged by um, liberal individuals. It's not immediately clear to us, based on the structure of these shows, the incentives of the networks, why the discussion is likely to be had by liberal individuals. 
or why the type of discussion, other than the fact that we kind of assume media more liberal, will lead to be one that's like challenging these views, just that they will be discussed. Um, and then I think we hear um, an argument, uh, you know, a good argument about the idea that you need to know what people believe, and there is some portion in order to combat it and just understand the political spectrum. And there is at least some uh, portion of the population that is not familiar with these beliefs. And so as a result, just having them in the open makes it more important or more capable, easier, informationally to combat them without necessarily saying that that will take place on the shows. Um, which I think are two distinct um, claims. And then that finally you perhaps uh, deconstruct the motivation of these figures when they feel more heard. Um, and so I guess that's just experientially they themselves will now feel as though they're getting the opportunity to speak. So it relies on this assumption that those claims are um, sincerely motivated rather than tools of sort of furthering their ideology. From opening opposition, I think initially the some of the argumentation we felt did rely upon uh, part what was out of the spectrum of the debate, uh, just because it, it you know was uh, attacking um, forms of media that ultimately your side does have to defend. But we do hear um, you know good refutation about or at least the questioning of the idea that the uh, the format of discussion we're talking about will be conducive to breaking down these ideas at all, and the idea. Um, yeah, that, that these tend to be um, pseudo-intellectual, and as a result, it has both the veneer of, of logic, which makes it palatable, but particularly difficult to break down, um, so at least the beginnings of those arguments. Moving back to DPM, I think we hear um, like a strong articulation of just the benefits that this has experientially for victims, um, when really, if, it, if allies oppose these views, then it reinforces their identity, which is valuable. And then the idea that perhaps they themselves now will feel more comfortable sharing their stories, which is uh, has an informational benefit, as well as is politically helpful. And that finally, this motivates moderates because you have a particularly visible episode of the worst forms of these beliefs. But again, we don't hear warranting about why these things are First of all, completely distinct from the information we have now. So you sort of assume that what you're premising this upon is the idea that you know the dark web is so inaccessible that most of the people we're talking about just don't know that the beliefs exist. And then that second of all, the types of way that this articulation is going to happen on these shows is uh, so visceral, visceral, excuse me, or impactful that it will spark that type of advocacy that you want. I think it's interesting because you tell us that simultaneously it'll be sort of a productive intellectual discussion, but that also the views are going to be articulated in such an impactful way that it's going to be sort of the match that lights advocacy against these people. And so I'm not entirely sure which way you think the conversation is going to break down and why you think that. So I think that's important when we get to the deputy speech because we hear First of all, just questioning, you know, it's intuitive why we want victims to feel reinforced, but when they weigh this against their own argument about, uh, you know, reinforcing and popularizing these beliefs, if it's not the case that we believe you actually break down these beliefs, but that you are exposing more people to them, I think this serves as a weighing argument for why we should be risk averse to exposing those victims to the beliefs more generally. I also don't think you justify for me why safe spaces matter, but at the very least it, it is, uh, you know, like I just said, a, a weighing mechanism for me to say if you don't achieve all of your solvency then like it's a, a pretty risky bargain. And then I think um, we get a bunch of really good warranting for why we think structurally the types of conversations you guys want are unlikely to happen. So the fact that you know the networks that invite these people on are most likely to be uh, pretty conservative themselves. Uh, the fact that the people are only going to agree to it if they can control the questions, and you know you, these networks have reputational incentives to make sure that that happens and that there's even a soundbite economy that these speakers participate in. So they have an incentive to say these particularly inflammatory comments that then can get retweeted, things of that sort. Um, so I think on the top half, that is the engagement where OO I think takes it, is giving us those reasons to believe inherently these conversations are not going to be productive, uh, and then just questioning the idea 
that you know, if we don't think they're going to be productive and we're not given a reason why we think they're going to ignite this advocacy, um, I think we prefer their stance that we would prefer just fewer people being exposed to those views. So bringing closing government into the round. So I think that there's a little bit of a problem with engagement in that we just hear some pretty important, important warranting from the deputy speaker that doesn't get dealt with in a robust way from, your, from you guys, and certainly in comparison on your bench, while they had the opportunity to proactively give us supporting warrants for their own articulation and conception of how these conversations would break down, you had the benefit of hearing exactly what their conception was and didn't give us any direct refutation, which was a very like big weakness in the entire bench's case, which is why in comparison to your own team, uh, to, to this team in front of you, it was difficult to prefer you. Um, in addition, I think that the main thrust of your extension, i.e. that one, some of the aspects of these views are at least factually correct and as a result should be incorporated, and that two, any nudge towards rational discourse is helpful, gets questioned really robustly, I think, by both uh, opposition teams from um, you know, the team directly across from you as well as in a POI from the opening team, how individuals can separate supporting not even completely truthful but quasi-truthful statements from conclusions. And we just don't hear a real articulation from you guys of exactly what that separation and distinction looks like. So I'm not sure uh, what marginal benefit you're getting. I think then adding closing opposition into the round, we get helpful contextualization from the, from the member speaker about exactly what type of statements and speakers we're talking about. That one, these aren't the incredible visceral articulations that opening government thinks will ignite advocacy, but that two, um, you know, often, you know, exactly this point that like you cannot make this separation. And if anything, we hear from the lip speaker, for example, we hear uh, statistics, to, like just saying a statistical fact itself does not make it truthful. You know, conflating correlation with causation, for example, is a big way that this takes place. Um, and then in addition, I think we got it's somewhat low hanging fruit, but like is an incremental way that is different than the opening um, idea of uh, um, what is the what's the action verb that I'm looking for of spreading these views, which is not necessarily just that they will get amplified in the news program itself, but that more people will go to the dark web and all of these other platforms that everyone on GovBench thinks are terrible when you are able to say, I'm on this show, and by the way, visit my website, by the way, go on Reddit, you know, all of those other things, which I think turns a lot of the impacts that we hear from you guys, especially insofar as all of the warrants from opening about the structure of these conversations are still standing. I think then also on the long diagonal here, in the whip speak, in the whip speech uh, in particular, I think we hear a lot of good refutation to the um, strong arguments coming out of the deputy speech from the opening team about um, uh, about the you know the how this will actually take place, uh, or excuse me, the benefits that will accrue the victims themselves. So the idea that um, it's not really explained to us why victims will be able to make these statements publicly. Often these movements, you know, the benefits are not are not exclusive to your side because this can also occur on social media, which perhaps is even better because it avoids the harms that open opening points out of just being shouted down publicly by people who disagree with you. Um, comparing you guys, and then finally in the whip speech, I don't think that we hear a lot of direct engagement either with you know the arguments coming out of opening or surely the contextualization and refutation coming out of the member speech. And so it's difficult to place you above them or above your opening who had neither the opportunity to respond directly to the warrants coming out of the uh, deputy speaker from OO, nor to anything that was really said by the closing team. Um, and then comparing directly on your bench, I think that with 
without a very explicit articulation from you guys about why the incremental contextualization or description of what types of statements these are functions in the round is more important than I think a pretty robustly laid out case about you know why structurally we think these conversations are going to happen the way that they are, as well as the amplification within the show argument. You give us sort of incremental ways that these views will get spread, as well as uh, help, you know, helpful additional arguments about why the conversations are going to take place in the way that they are. But given that I think those arguments are already relatively well substantiated by the opening team, I think we needed more of an explicit um, direction about why we should prefer the way that you established those arguments um, in contrast to your opening team, even though I think you did a good job of also establishing them. Um, so if I could ask, so maybe sure. more detail on exactly what the you know, fundamental critique thing means in practice. Yeah, like, exactly, exactly. The fact that it's because of culture is like a pushback against like gender inequality. Right, right. Or or even you know why that difference than just pseudo pseudo you know what I mean? Like yeah. why yeah, exactly. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really enjoyed the round. Very happy to